In 2011, the last Harry Potter film premiered for many, bringing an end to their childhoods. Not only had Harry and his friend's journey come to an end, they had grown up, and by the looks of them, they were probably dying too. It was time to put Harry Potter to rest. And then in 2016, JK Rowling was like, psych, there's way more money out there that's in your pockets and not my pockets. Hey, guess what? Cedric Diggory's a fascist now. Give me all your money. So basically, she made a ton of crap we all hate. Mobile games that cost a blood sacrifice for each microtransaction. A new five film series that ranges from generic and soulless to a complete disaster. A play where Hermione becomes the minister for magic and still doesn't free the house elves. And now JK Rowling's Twitter is basically the official companion to the novels. And then to make matters worse, Rowling then came out on Twitter as a smurf. No, sorry, I misread that, it says turf. She came out as a turf. Oh God, that is so much worse. In response to that, the creators of the new Hogwarts Legacy game have attempted to distance their work from Rowling, assuring us that, in fact, you can play as a trans Hogwarts student in the game. And I have to admit, I, I was a little tempted to take a little cheeky peek at this game, but the discourse on the Twitter and on forums has assured me that I'm supporting Joanne Kilgrave Rowling's anti-trans sentiments if I so much as pirate the game. Is this just how the world has to be now? Kids are raised in a society with a cultural staple like Harry Potter or Mickey Mouse and then the billionaire owners of these franchises say something shitty and then we have to vote as to whether we support their shitty remarks by buying or boycotting? Well you know what, I have another solution. If we all just take a step back and look at the bigger picture, it all seems pretty obvious. We should just take the rights to Harry Potter away from JK Rowling. <laughs> One day, a friend of mine, she had gotten a letter from Warner Brothers telling her that if she did not shut down her website, they would sick their lawyers on her. She was this 12-year-old girl who thought that she was going to go to prison because she was running a Harry Potter fan site. JK Rowling owns the copyright to Harry Potter. Copyright basically means that only the author can profit from their work. JK Rowling and whoever she licenses it to have the right to sell you Harry Potter books and merch. But if someone wants to write and sell their own take on Harry Potter where, let's say, Harry and Draco get together, that's very illegal. And they'll get in lots of trouble unless all the names are changed and all the recognisable features of the original setting are just scrubbed. And that seems fair, right? It wouldn't be right to profit off someone else's ideas. Luckily, Harry Potter was completely original and JK Rowling didn't profit from anyone else's ideas in any way. Actually, Rowling's work is far from original. The trope of the orphaned boy with the magical mentor can be seen in The Lord of the Rings and Star Wars, T.H. White's Arthur. The idea of a doorway to a magical world at King's Cross Station can be seen in Eva Ibbotson's The Secret of Platform 13. Schools for wizards and witches are featured in Ursula K. Le Guin's Earthsea books and Jill Murphy's The Worst Witch. Giant spiders in the forest? That's straight out of The Hobbit. Trolls and hooded beings and living trees and dragons? All Tolkien. Rooms bigger on the inside are just an old British tradition at this point. The Dark Lord is literally the name for Sauron in Tolkien, while the villain's former mentor being the hero's current mentor smacks of Star Wars again, and the idea of a magical people supremacist is pulled right out of the X-Men. Even the idea of Horcruxes is literally just Tolkien's one ring. Critics have said these books are so successful because they are steeped in the traditions of genre fiction. And that's okay. In fact, that's kind of a good thing. These are tried and tested tropes and archetypes. They work. A lot of creative works are just really good remixes of ideas that humanity has been obsessed with for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And there is talent involved in remixing those ideas in a new way. There's so much about Harry Potter that made it special and worked in a very particular cultural moment like nothing before. And while the original books were definitely fun and escapist, a huge part of their success can be attributed to how perfectly they lend themselves to branding and marketing and creating fandom. A massive part of the appeal of the series is the magical world of Hogwarts. You want to imagine you can go there too. And you can literally visit the doorway there, just head over to King's Cross Station in the UK. And the films gave this escapist fantasy quite literally a uniform and a tangible appearance. You can buy your own Hogwarts outfit. There's a ton of officially licensed merch with the house crests. There's a sense of immersion in this fantasy, the idea that you too could go to Hogwarts. And it wasn't just the films that helped launch Harry Potter to the next level of popularity. Academics have talked about how a massive part of the franchise's global success can be attributed to fandom. If ever a product were co-created, that product is surely Harry Potter. 
countless millions of mad keen consumers have contributed to the Happy Harry experience. The service Potter provides owes as much, if not more, to consumer co-creators as it does to Warner Brothers, Scholastic, Bloomsbury and the remainder of the official wizard stakeholders. Fandom makes consuming media a social experience. It helps you enjoy a work for longer and have a deeper connection with it. It offers you a new perspective on your favourite media, helps fix plot holes or offers alternatives to storylines you don't like. It can get you through a particularly long hiatus between book four and book five. Don't think Hermione would have ended up with Ron? There are fanfics for that. Think Harry would have married Draco and had lots and lots of sex with him? I'm pretty sure there are more fics for that than there are books in the world. This way of extending the work means that there's a huge fandom to fall back on, constant new content. And as long as people are still focused on the franchise, there's money to be made for the IP owners. And fandom doesn't just improve the experience of the fans, it also helps promote the original work. A lot of the original Harry Potter hype around the first book happened through word of mouth and later through media attention garnered by things like excited teens in wizarding attire at the midnight release that would constantly make the news. Since Harry Potter and the internet kind of entered the mainstream at the same time, Harry Potter became the first modern fandom that relied on the internet and not just fanzines or in-person conventions. But because the internet was still so young at the time, no one was quite sure how copyright around stuff like fan fiction would work. Technically publishing your own work based on copyrighted and trademarked material was distinctly illegal and still is. At the beginning Warner Brothers took it very seriously and started cracking down on fan sites online which were literally run by kids, teenagers who just wanted to make content and find fandom. Warner Brothers sent them cease and desist letters and threatened to take down their sites if they saw anything they didn't like. A teenager named Heather Lorva spearheaded the Potter War campaign to fight back against Warner Brothers. I became the spokeswoman for the campaign and orchestrated a worldwide boycott against all things Harry Potter except the books. The fans felt that actually the studio owed them a lot for making the property so successful. It was like a fan workers strike. And that idea that the fans are actually kind of like workers who can strike isn't as ludicrous as it sounds. I mean, okay, just bear with me. There's actually academic research on fandoms and companies' relationships to it, and lots of researchers have suggested fandom is actually unpaid labour that adds a lot of values to the properties it forms around. Take the video game Skyrim, for example. Fan mods have meant that despite the lack of new content on the part of Bethesda, there is always new Skyrim content to play. New locations, new equipment, new aesthetics, new gameplay. This has majorly contributed to the fact that Skyrim is one of the most successful games of all time and people still play it over a decade after the release. Fanfic does the same kind of thing for Harry Potter. And actually, in a similar way to modding, fanfic can help to improve the work, at least in the eye of the beholder, or customise it to personal preferences. IP owners also can save a lot of money from fans sharing content. Marketing is expensive, but your engagement with their content on social media saves them a lot. Disney used to have a reputation as the world's largest copyright enforcer due to numerous lawsuits against small businesses and artists. In fact, in 1989, Disney came under fire for ordering a daycare centre to take down paintings of Mickey Mouse and friends on the daycare wall because it was a breach of copyright. Five-year-old Christopher Bombacy said, If they took them off the wall, I'd be sad. Disney, I hope you understand that you're responsible for all of Christopher's future mental health problems. These days, Disney seems to have changed its tune on fan-created content since thousands of Frozen covers and parodies on YouTube helped make Frozen one of the highest grossing animated films of all time. Disney used to see YouTube as a threat and a tool for mass piracy, but Frozen made them realise that actually fan-created content is incredible advertising that no money can buy. They proceeded to buy a production house for over 55,000 YouTube channels. They launched programs for working with online creators, giving select groups advanced PR information, and training Disney fans on how to become better online influencers. Just like Warner Brothers with the Potter Wars, Disney has also realised that actually, yeah, fandom was critical to their success. You have to keep the fans happy, you want their approval of the work because they buy it and they are integral to promoting it. Hitting them in the wallet really worked. Fandom doesn't actually steal from the pockets of IP owners, 
It creates a deeply invested community, one which is happy and eager to spend money, sometimes to have their whole lives revolve around a property. Fandom helped make Harry Potter a global phenomenon to the point where it seems inescapable. Everyone knows who Harry Potter is. Words from the franchise have been added to English dictionaries because people use them in their everyday speech. There's Potter merchandise in every shop, and publishing has been changed forever by Harry Potter in a way which would require a whole other video to explain. Whether we like it or not, Harry Potter has become a part of mainstream culture, just like Snow White or Sherlock Holmes or Superman. And like them, it's kind of got a life of its own. After Rowling's turf reveal, most big fandom names and websites have distanced themselves from her and voiced their support for trans people. A lot of Harry Potter fans are trans people, and it seems that fandom for the most part is just continuing on its own, completely independent from, and often in direct opposition to, what Rowling is doing. I think a lot of people are choosing to focus on the fandom aspect of it. She can do all that stuff over there, but we're gonna keep the Potter series. This is no longer hers. We, the fans, own the wizarding world. She's a landlord, you know, and we're cancelling rent. A lot of people officially associated with the franchise have also distanced themselves from Rowling. Several actors have voiced their support for trans people. She wasn't interviewed for the 20th anniversary documentary. The publisher of the upcoming game, Hogwarts Legacy, keeps stressing how she had nothing to do with the game's development. Although they managed to stir up enough controversy all on their own. Ugh. And to be honest, she's not involved in the creation of most of the other Harry Potter releases either. The stage production was written by some randos, the games are made by various game companies, most tie-in books are written by other people, she's certainly not designing any of the endless merch. One of the few things she is still doing personally is screenwriting for the Fantastic Beast films, and um... That's not really going very well, is it? Critics said that the plot of the second Fantastic Beasts was confusing and felt like an overload of homework. Imagine critics saying that your family romp film feels like homework. She took the, the, the school setting away and now it just feels like homework. What, what's her problem? The ticket sales went down so much that she was assigned a babysitter co-writer for the third film in hopes of salvaging the franchise, which is supposed to go on for five films? Who wanted- no one asked for five more films, Jesus. The Harry Potter brand is so institutionalized that even if Rowling wanted to burn it down, I'm not sure she could. Nothing of this scale and cultural relevance can belong to just one person, and it can't be erased either. Telling people to ignore the trailer for the new game and to throw out their old books and forget about Harry Potter is as realistic as telling people to forget that Superman ever existed. The only reason Rowling is profiting from all these other people's work is because legally Harry Potter belongs to her. But it won't always. <laughs> When it comes to copyright, there are two sides to consider. On the one hand, you have the author. You want the author to reap all the benefits of their work so they can recoup all the effort and time that went into creating. Copyright is basically a form of monopoly, allowing the author to be the only one to profit from their own work for a limited amount of time. Now, people usually agree that monopolies are bad, but the logic behind copyright enabling monopoly is that if people are given monopoly over their creations, that will reward their work and they will be incentivized to create more. Rowling is deeply invested in her own monopoly and control over Harry Potter. There's a fan site called Harry Potter Lexicon which provides explanations for characters, locations, spells and other Harry Potter lore. Rowling herself said she regularly used the website for fact checking when writing new books. But when the author of the site tried to publish the lexicon as a physical book, she took him to court even though, as the Fair Use Project at Stanford University Law School said, no court has ever recognized the author's monopoly on the right to publish reference guides and other non-academic research relating to their fiction. So Rowling's definitely on the extreme end of the spectrum of supporting the author's rights. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the public. It's in the public's best interest for the works to be in the public domain as soon as possible, so they can consume them freely and use them to create more work. Public domain is what happens when the copyright for a work expires, and it becomes free for anyone to use it in any way their heart desires. When copyright was first established in the UK, it lasted for 14 years after the publication, same in America, after which the works would fall into the public domain. Today, copyright typically expires 50 to 100 years after the author has died. So Harry Potter won't be in the public domain for at least another 
100 years. <laughs> Unless Rowling ends up like one of those future Futurama heads in a jar, you know? In which case it could be thousands of years, perhaps millions. This is going to be very simplified, but when trying to figure out how long copyright should last, experts are basically figuring out a compromise between giving the author long enough to profit from their work and giving the public freedom to use that work for further creativity, innovation and enjoyment. Economists have suggested solutions for a fair compromise on how long copyright should last. Landers and Posner, for example, have calculated that if we take into account that works make the most money immediately after their release and then start losing value every subsequent year, 25 years is the most meaningful length for copyright to last. If we imagine that for Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, 25 years would be now. The first Harry Potter book would be entering the public domain now. Baldrin and Levine, on the other hand, point out that market growth and expansion in the modern world mean that authors have a chance to profit off their work much faster. If the British Parliament thought 14 years was fair in 1710, Baldrin and Levine calculate that today, there's no way to justify why copyright should last longer than seven years, and their model actually shows that the optimal length of copyright would be two years. Now, proponents of extending copyright say that if authors know they can benefit from their works for longer, they will be more likely to create more work. So for instance, a musician might only write a song if they know their copyright will last for several decades. But if that were true, then the number of works should increase every time legislation is changed and the duration of copyright is extended. But that that's just not what's happening. As Blur drummer Dave Roundtree said, I have never heard of a single band deciding not to record a song because it will fall out of copyright in only 50 years. The idea is laughable. So why is it so long? Current copyright law in the US is the entire life of the author plus 70 years. So not only do you get to keep it your entire life, your heirs also inherit it. How that's meant to incentivize creativity, I'm not quite sure. It's turning personal monopolies over your own idea into market monopolies where a few companies own most of all entertainment. We have a world now where we grew up with Mickey Mouse, as did our parents, as did our grandparents. But if you published a story about Mickey Mouse, you would be sued by a massive faceless media corporation. Most of the media we grow up with now is owned by one of only a handful of these massive faceless media corporations. These laws were designed to protect and incentivize individuals, but they've now evolved to benefit the profit of corporations so massive that their existence is unprecedented in human history. Their main motivation is ever increasing profit, which affects the quality of art and entertainment as well as the variety of it. Economists Michaela Boldrin and David K. Levine used theoretical calculations to see whether there would be more innovation and market growth in a society with copyright or in a society without copyright. They call copyright the monopoly model and the lack of copyright the competitive model because innovation in a copyright free society would be driven by competition and exchange of ideas. They showed that even if copyright didn't exist, creators could still make money off their ideas. but probably not as much money as if they're granted exclusive IP rights. So the idea is that the extra money copyright affords creators should encourage them to create more new work. But they point out, no innovation exists in a vacuum. We've already seen how derivative Harry Potter is. The culture in which it was written is inevitably enormously influential on it. Whether you're writing Harry Potter or inventing a vaccine, your work will rely on the ideas of those who came before you. IP laws lock those ideas away, which means less opportunity for innovation. Any monetary incentive the monopoly model might give creators is immediately cancelled out by the lack of ideas and works they're allowed to play around with. What's more, Baldrin and Levine prove that IP protection is actually significantly impeding innovation and growth. We tend to think of a lone genius coming up with scientific innovation, but in reality, it's often that there are several groups working on the same idea simultaneously because the time is ripe. They suggest that the Industrial Revolution was actually stalled for one or two decades because of the patent on the steam engine by a guy who wasn't even the only one working on it. Widespread use and improvement of steam engines didn't actually happen until his patent expired. And even after the expiration, 
he was still able to make good money off of it. Bro, thanks a bunch for stalling the industrial revolution, dude. We could have, we could have been two decades ahead by now. I could have a flying car and a robot dog. So even if you believe in economic growth as a good goal, there is proof suggesting copyright is actually impeding it. But people also oppose copyright because of other reasons. Some believe that copyright laws hurt the progress of science and culture and stifle creativity. Some people think that IP laws actually extended the current pandemic and made it worse because most vaccines are patented. But a team of scientists in Texas created a COVID vaccine that they won't patent. They also specifically designed it so it can be manufactured without specialized new equipment and stored in standard refrigerators. The goal of their whole project was to allow anyone to manufacture a COVID vaccine, especially low-income countries that are under-vaccinated and thus more likely to be a source of new variants. The team leader, Maria Botazzi, said, We want to do good in the world. This was the right thing to do, and this is what we morally had to do. We didn't think, how can we take advantage of this? If more like us would have been more attuned to how the world is so inequitable, we could have basically not even seen these variants arise. We need to break these paradigms that it's only driven by return of economic investment. We have to look at the return in public health. Some creators give away their works for free because they want to contribute to the common good or give back to the community. People have created whole alternative licenses to copyrights such as Creative Commons, which gives creators a lot more flexibility in deciding how others are allowed to use their work. For example, they might allow distribution, but as long as it's non-profit and credited to the author, or let people use it in any way without the need to credit the author at all. Software developer PJ Anori said that everyone who works on the internet has taken advantage of free and open source work in some way. Those websites that let you use free photos Finding a new free font for your project? Using Firefox or Wikipedia? Your favorite Twitch streamer's background music? Mmm, that's some delicious open source right there. <laughs> the internet would not be the internet that we know without free and open source projects moving it forward. With that in mind, I consider it the obligation of those who make a living on the internet to carry their share of the weight and offer up something in return. JK Rowling is not the only one who's built an empire on characters and stories from folklore and mythology and the literary canon. Disney is notorious for mining the public domain for narratives they can turn into films and then copyright, sometimes going as far as to try to trademark a whole fucking national holiday. It seems hypocritical, to put it mildly, that the exchange of ideas should stop with them when they have benefited so much from the wealth of ideas in the public domain. And Disney's not just passively benefiting from the current laws, they're known to spend a lot of money lobbying for extensions of copyright laws every time one of their precious properties is close to coming into public domain. If you're wondering how we got from 14 years of copyright to life plus 70 years, one of the reasons is Disney. The 1998 law that changed the duration of copyright in the US from the author's life plus 50 years to the author's life plus 70 years has been derisively named the Mickey Mouse Protection Act because they were one of the main forces behind it. In fact, every time Mickey Mouse is about to come into public domain, American laws change and copyright is extended. Last time this was about to happen, people talked about how Disney was about to lose Mickey Mouse as if he was being cruelly stolen from them and they could never make another overpriced Mickey headband. I guess in that moment, they understood how five-year-old Christopher Bombacy felt. But that's not what copyright expiring means. Disney would be free to keep making Mickey cartoons and books and toys. It's just that with Mickey in the public domain, anyone else could also make Mickey art and products without getting in legal trouble. Disney could still make a lot of money off Mickey, but they might just have to step up their game and compete with people selling better, more ethical, or just local products. Same with Harry Potter. There would be absolutely nothing stopping JK Rowling from producing more Fantastic Beasts films. God, God knows we need him. Let's go for 20, JK. But if, say, copyright was shortened to 25 years, in 2024, Prisoner of Azkaban would come into public domain, which means someone would be able to produce that Marauders TV show fandom has been dreaming about for years and make it super friggin' gay, and her garbage films would have to compete with the Potter product fans actually want. One thing that could throw a wrench into this creative utopia is trademark, which is a different form of intellectual property from copyright. The main point of trademark is to help the public identify products or services from a particular source, so you can't sell an off-brand product with an expensive brand label and confuse the customer into thinking it's the good stuff. You can't trademark a book 
but you can, for example, trademark the name Harry Potter, and that offers you another layer of legal protection from anyone else who would want to sell Harry Potter stuff. In America, you can use your trademark forever, for all of eternity, but only if you keep using it. If you stop using it for too long, you lose the trademark. So because of this need to prove that you're using a trademark, American law has been criticised for encouraging commodification and overconsumption. There are hundreds of trademarks related to Harry Potter, and to keep them, the owners have to keep churning out an endless stream of Potter merchandise for every trademarked character, spell, creature, object, location. They trademarked Nomad. What? The Nomad. No magic. The non-wizard! Yeah, because we all want no magic. it's just such a great word, it just rolls off the tongue. Ooh, the no is fuck off. Infinite copyright is actually illegal under the US Constitution, whereas trademark lasts potentially forever as long as you're still using it. This means that even if you no longer own the copyright to something, Tarzan, for example, who is in the public domain, public use of Tarzan might still be contested because a company still owns the Tarzan trademark. Steamboat Willie was Mickey Mouse's first ever appearance. If no legislation changes in the next few years, Steamboat Willie will become public domain in 2024, meaning that in theory, this gloveless black and white version of Mickey will be available for public use. I can finally publish my Steamboat Willie fic. Mickey Mouse meets Dracula. However, even if you're very careful to only use this version of Mickey, Disney might still be able to weaponize their trademark against unauthorized Mickey Mouse products. Though it does seem, from legal precedent, that American courts are taking a stance against exploiting trademark to mess with copyright. But it also seems from legal precedent that wealthy trademark owners are eager to try and make it happen anyway and take people to court. It's a fairly new minefield of IP law, and we'll just have to wait and see how things play out as more works age out of copyright but remain attached to trademarks. If Disney doesn't manage to lobby for any more copyright extensions, it might be a whole new era for IP law, and maybe trademark regulations will have to be adapted for this new landscape. But the good news is, it seems they might have hit their limit and won't be able to lobby for any more extensions. Back in 1998, the resistance to the new law was led by a law professor who was up against not just Disney, but also Time Warner, Universal, Viacom, and the major professional sports leagues like the NFL and the NBA, who were all lobbying for the extension. Because of their efforts, not a single work passed into public domain for 21 years in America. The fact that since 2019 that has changed and works are again falling out of copyright is seen as a good sign by defenders of public domain. Three of the most powerful rights holder groups in America said they were not even going to try to pass legislation extending copyright anymore because they know they couldn't win. The internet has allowed people to not only better understand and enjoy free to use works, but it also enabled formation of groups that are lobbying against copyright extension and who, for example, successfully defeated a new Disney-backed law in 2012. The wave of endless copyright extensions is probably over. Now it's time to turn the tide, undo the damage and get involved in efforts that will shorten copyright and possibly modify trademark as well. And because these laws are often internationally coordinated, the change must happen globally, not just in America. Wherever in the world you are, you can help take back childhood favourites that are being held hostage by massive corporations and greedy billionaires. The point of all this isn't to say Rowling doesn't deserve credit for her work, rather, she didn't do all of this on her own to begin with, and either way, she has profited far more than most authors can ever begin to imagine. And Harry Potter has grown way beyond her. It belongs as much to the fans as it does to her. Did you know that the real-life Quidditch game that she has had no involvement with is considered one of the most inclusive sports out there? In part because each team is allowed a maximum of four players of the same gender on the field at a time. The reason the Oxford Dictionary now includes the word Quidditch is in part because of the existence of the real-life Quidditch sport taking it from fantasy to reality. And now the Quidditch leagues are having to change the name of the sport, not only to distance themselves from rolling, but because the sport can only increase so much in size before there will be legal issues regarding the trademark of their name. This fandom is bigger than JK Rowling, and it deserves more than having to bow down to corrupt intellectual property laws. Harry Potter fans have banded together before to stand up to Warner Brother and copyright, 
and I don't see why it couldn't happen again. At this point, Harry Potter's never gonna go away. But imagine a world where your local community theatre can produce their own Harry Potter play and make it as queer and trans and anti-racist as they like. Imagine a world where Grandma can sell her own homemade Hufflepuff scarves online without having to worry about legal action from Warner Brothers. Imagine a world where five-year-old Christopher Bombacy doesn't have to be sad. There's a version of this where the fans win, where the people win. To be clear, I would not feel differently about all of this if Rowling were a trans ally. This isn't about taking her down, it's about questioning the ethics of a system which is designed to put a few people at the top while the rest of us are powerless. And I'm not saying don't boycott JK Rowling, God knows she doesn't need any more money, I'm just saying we have to think bigger. If we can only ethically consume fan work, then we can only enjoy work that is unpaid. That doesn't seem fair. And on top of that, perpetuating any fandom just ends up profiting Warner Brothers and Rowling because fandom is an extension of the appeal of the IP. Even angrily complaining about Harry Potter on Twitter just contributes to more press for them. This is not the kind of world where great art thrives. And I hope we can change that for our sake and for the sake of future generations. Maybe it's a fantasy, but I do think that if any fandom could rise up and make a change to a broken system, it's this one. This isn't just a fight for Harry bloody Potter, it's a fight for culture. It's not just a fight for culture, it's a fight for the economic and creative freedom of humanity. You know, we don't tell stories to own them. We tell stories to share them. Ursula K. Le Guin once said, Imagination can be co-opted and degraded, but it survives commercial and didactic exploitation. The land outlasts the empires. The conquerors may leave desert where there was forest and meadow, but the rain will fall, the rivers will run to the sea. The realms of once upon a time are as much a part of human history and thought as the nations in our kaleidoscopic atlases, and some are more enduring. If you'd like to support my creative endeavours, please consider supporting my Patreon, and otherwise, please like and subscribe. Special thanks to all my patrons from us here at the Verily School for bitchcraft and bizardry. And extra house points go to Eric Parkinson, Angela, Kat R, Chris Endicott, Corwin Found, Danny Aiden Stone, Fluffy Bunny Boo, Helena Varvarousis, Justin DeLima, Metheta, Non Anonymous, Siobhan, Steve Wallace, Tasha Heim, The Digital Witch, Wix, Yuri Levs, Erin, AJ, Alice, Elena Vera, Amelia D, Andreas Evans, Anna S, Apathetic Gaiety, Arden, it's so worth it to hear Verity say my name. Avery Ott, B, Ben Hengst, Beslaff, Beth Hershey, Break Every Yoke, Kane Friedman, Katrina Lexi, Charis Edwards, Chloe Strange, Claire, Connor Thompson, Deanna McMillan, Dropout Ninja, Eden Ladley, Erie Enby, Ellie Cannard, Elsie Astro, Emery James Fairgrieve, Evergarden Wall, Fafe Alania, Fancy Angles, Fatal Drum, Felixer of Life, Gabriella Day, Gavin Salmon, Gerald Brenter, Ghosts and You Might Die, Grace Robertson, Hellfrog, Henry Mead, Hilda Mangold, Jam Kwasowski, Jenlifer Fronister, Jessage, Joy B, Jules, Jules, Juliana C, Juliana Backer, Juniper Lopez, Kale, Kate and Jess, Katie B, Katie Ballinger, Kalani Garcia, Kisa, Kyle Denley, Lacey Cox, Lindsay Mercer, Lisa Spitalovitz, Malva, Marla, McKenning Wood, Mike Bucket, Miss Mad, Mazaka de Mazan, Muggsy, Moshe Gordon Raiden, Mirren McGlynn, Nat Jordan, Neve, Nico, Nick Snary, Nina, Oxy, Ossian Matthew, Penny Lynn, Pregnant Seinfeld, Queer Aesthetic, Radical Planning, Rebecca Peacock, River Haddock, Rob St. Mary, Rock the Shell, Sarah R, Sarah R, Savard Moosin, Soya Donk, Shockstopia, Shaved Headed By, She Algorithm, Sithvich, Soy, Spaghetti Rabbit, Straw Fox, Summertime Killer, Susie S, Speepal the Trans Boy Valkyrie, The Children of Jack Acid, Tia Till, Tina Gigia, Tom Harrison, Troy Zayer, Vera Van Monfrans, Verlux, Vicious Panda, Vince Whitaker, Wandering Sock, Wards, Will O'Connor, Jonathan Zunga, and Yuli Themstedt.